Hi, I'm Harry Dent. My goal today is to teach you something very simple, to show you how you can predict the key economic trends that can impact your life, your business, your family, and your investments over the rest of your lifetime. Now, obviously, most economists don't talk this way. And it's because they don't understand people, the most important factor in our economy. They're always looking at government policies and not realizing governments only react to the trends set by peoples and businesses. They don't create our real growth and productivity and, and progress in our economy. Governments only 20% of our GDP and most of their spending is increasingly what? Fixed, not discretionary. Doesn't vary that much. What varies is the consumer life cycle and the businesses that gear up and invest to serve them. So that's what I look at. I look at people, because people drive our economy. And the secret to understanding people's impact is something I call demographics. My first book was called Our Power to Predict in 1989. And our whole view is demographics is destiny. It's that simple. I think a French uh, uh, philosopher said that way back hundreds of years ago. And it's really true. People do predictable things as they age. Now, just, just for example, if, if, if somebody told you, okay, we've got three candidates to run your company, one's an 18-year-old, one's a 46-year-old, and one's 89. If you knew nothing else, wouldn't that be a pretty easy decision? You have a higher probability. I'm going to show today age 46 is the most important number in our economy because that's when the average person spends the most money in their entire lifetime. So when new generations move into this peak in spending, that's when our economy booms. Now, when I was in college, I took economics. I majored in economics, for, but I only lasted three courses until I gave up. I mean, to me, these people couldn't explain stuff to people, don't agree looking at the same facts, and they will literally tell you nobody can predict our economy past the next election. So I'm like, well, I'm in the wrong place because I'm into predicting stuff. So I start taking accounting and finance. That was my first major. And the course that most impressed me was one I would have least expected. It was about life insurance actuarial sciences. Because this is when I first saw, here's people that can predict the future way in advance and can predict things about people. In this case, they predict when the average person's going to die. Now, here's the difference between complexity and short-term forecasting and long-term. Long-term is much simple because you can bring it down to average. It's easy for a life insurance actuary to determine in any country, and for example, the United States, average person's going to die at age 79.6, down to the decimal point, and it's moving forward about one and a half years every decade. That's how precise it is. Now, instead, I better look out at the audience. Could I guess when any, any individual in this audience is going to die? That would be extremely difficult. So the law of averages makes longer term trends, especially in demographics, more predictable. So simple tools. We forecast economic change based on three tools. One, broader demographic trends. That's the first thing. When does the economy boom and bust? When do we have inflation or falling inflation or even deflation? And then we can look at more specific, predictable consumer spending patterns. And I'm talking down to potato chips. You know when the average family buys the most potato chips in their whole life cycle? Age 42. The reason is the average parent has their average kid at 28, and then the kid's calorie cycle peaks, and this is medically proven, at age 14. So 28 plus 14. Age 42 is the number of you're in the potato chip business or even in grocery stores. And then there's another factor I learned early on about people. We adopt new technologies, and new technologies are what make us more productive workers and raise our incomes and our wealth over time. We adopt new technologies in a predictable S-curve fashion. And 80% of the progress in an S-curve comes in one-fifth of the time. That's the old 80-20 rule. So technology, S-curves, and people adopting new work habits, new technologies, everything, that is also predictable once a trend gets going. So again, our, our economy has two levels that we study. 
Again, the easiest one is the macroeconomics, the large trend. Again, people moving towards their peak and spending at age 46 and then slowing after that. But then the microeconomics, individual choices. When do people have to spend money on childcare? Again, potato chips, homes, cars, healthcare facilities, life insurance. We'll show cruise ships. I can predict, just like a life insurance actuary can predict when the average person is going to die, I can predict everything in between from cradle to grave or what I call cribs to nursing homes. So how powerful would that be? And again, the macro trends, that age 46 number I told you, that one number allowed me in 1989 to predict the 14 year crash of Japan while at the same time moving into the 90s, the US and Europe would see the greatest boom in stock market advance in modern history. One simple number, with a lag, allowed me to see those two trends. Now, how much would that have impacted your investments or your business or your family or anything else if you could have seen something that big happening? So macroeconomists are wrong about big things. They did not see Japan collapse. In fact, economists were telling people literally in the late 80s that Japan was going to surpass the U.S. economy in the, in the two decades to follow. And I said right then, that is demographically impossible, will not happen. In fact, the Japanese are at their peak and we're just getting going. That's the difference because they have very different demographic trends from the U.S. and Europe. And microeconomists are wrong about lots of things. I remember I was in the baby boom growing up. They never built enough schools fast enough. We're coming, and once we left the school system, they kept building them. So how do you predict when you need more colleges? How about 18? About age 18, that's what people enter college on average. It's not hard to do. Economists are not trained to think this way. I learned a lot about demographics in my marketing courses in business, and I learned about demographics when I was consulting to new ventures in California in the early 80s because they were appealing to the young then, new baby boom generation that were setting all types of new trends. So when I studied this generation, I'm like, wow, they're big, they're impactful, and I learned to predict more about them. So it's kind of like the rational man principle. I mean, we're kind of irrational ways, but, but when it comes down to these average things, we do do predictable things at predictable times. And, and we just make certain choices, and a lot of it's around the family and the kids. So when did you get married? I'll tell you when the average person does, age 26 for the baby boomers. It's a little later for the millennial generations. When do you have your first kid? Well, for baby boomers, it was 28, as I said earlier. When you buy your first car, 25. When you buy your biggest car, 54. When you buy your first house, 31. When people buy their largest house, 41. So economic change depends on the herd or what I call new generations, people that are born in waves and then do predictable things as they wage as a collective generation. So you just have to figure out and study why and when people do things, find the main source of their economic and emotional pain in people's lives, so we know what to plan for and look out for, what is driving their decision making, which we know to be irrationally individually, but collectively surprisingly rational and predictable. So what are the important points in people's life? Workforce entry, is that important? When people actually start contributing to the economy instead of costing? Their parents in the economy, that's at age 20 on average. Some people at 18 out of high school, others at 22, it averages 20. When we have our kids, kids drive everything. We, we, we work hard to raise our kids and hopefully to get them into college and a great education. We have, the baby boomers had their average kid at 28, the millennials were having it two or three years later. Our career cycle, which starts at workforce entry at age 20, and peaks for the average person when they retire. Now, you would think 65, but it's actually 63. The people actually, on average, retire. So these are the things that drive our economy. It is not good for our economy when a lot of people retire and stop working and contributing. And it's not good for our economy when young people cost everything and produce nothing. That's actually, I'll show later, what causes inflation. No economist would ever tell you that. Young people cause inflation. Older people downsize, slow down, and actually cause deflation in prices. So demographics, 
Knowledge affects per people's lives and their business decisions. So we ought to have good information for that. Where do we invest and when? For our kids' education, for our retirement. And, and you don't just invest in one area of the economy because what's growing is always changing and demographics allow us to predict that. Where are the best lucrative jobs in any time in the economy cycle for your kids or for you? And where should you expand your business and where should you not? And again, why did they build schools when baby boomers were out of the school system? That would have been easy to predict. Same with any business. They always build too many homes at the end of the cycle and developers go under. You can see that coming. Now, so what I start with is births. Start with people. We don't get people without them being born, and you don't get people born without somebody having sex. So it's actually sex that drives our economy, I've always said, and that's why economists have never figured it out. It's not their thing, in case you haven't noticed. So we, we look for it, and I'll show a graph of this later, but there's clear surges in births. The Bob Hope generation before the baby boom had a surge from 1909 to 1914, and then a downtrend coming off of World War I, 1917 to 19. Then another surge from 1920 to 21, and then from 1924 to 33, a big downturn in births. We'll show how big an impact that has on the economy later down the road. The baby boom, the first wave was 1937 to 43, and then downturn during World War II, 44 to 45, and then a sharp wave, what, when the soldiers came back, 46 to 47, a downturn 48 to 50, and then the biggest wave crested from 1951 into 1957 to 61, a plateau, and then we had a big downturn from 62 to 68, a little bounce, 69 to 70, and then down into 1971 to 73, and a double bottom in 75. So people are born, and we start here because they're going to do these predictable things, and everything's a lag on these birth surges. Millennials, the young people today, their first wave was 1976 to 1990. Then they had a seven-year downturn from 1991 to 97 longer than any of the baby boomers. Second wave, 1998 to 2000, and now they are in a downturn. And I predicted this before it happened. People have less kids when the economy's bad. Future doesn't look good, so people don't want to have kids. So I said after 2007, because we'll show we predicted the economy would peak in 2007, the baby boomers, that the millennial generation's births would go down and immigration would drop as well, same reasons. And I'm predicting that they're going to bottom out in their births around 2023 because that'll be nine months after the worst of the baby boom downturn ahead. Immigrants. Well, they're important, especially in the United States, in countries I lecture in a lot like Canada and Australia and New Zealand. Because immigrants come in, and this is actually a good thing people don't realize, they come in right in prime workforce age in their 20s ready to work and you don't have to educate them and raise them and all that stuff it's already been done well what that's a good deal so again most of the immigrants are in their 20s and 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 then they will come in and work and rise in their careers and join the present generation so i have to adjust for them and this is what i do this is the birth index in the United States back as far as it goes, 1909. And then I adjust it with that graph before. That's a bell curve of how old immigrants are. And I can tell if a million immigrants come in our economy, I can place them in the year they were born on average so I can put them in the same birth index as the people born here. So now we're doing apples and apples. Now this graph, I mean, this is obviously very impactful. Look at these generations and look at the size of the baby boom generation. Now, I'm a cycle guy at heart. Now, every 250 years, like the American Revolution, you get an outsized generation that causes outsized changes and in innovation and booms in our economy. This is one of them. I call the baby boom like a 10-foot wave. The Bob Hope generation before it here, like a 3-foot wave and the millennial generation to follow, and note they don't take us to higher highs for the first generation in history. 
is like a five foot wave. So where are you gonna see the biggest boom when these people are moving their peak spending and raising their families and advancing in their careers, the baby boomers? And the baby boom boom, I, I summed that up in detail, but basically 1937 to 1961. So we'll show later, we had 46 of that, that'll tell you when the economy's gonna boom, 1983 to 2007. Now, is that simple or not? The echo boom has not entered their spending boom yet, and they will start around 2023 and go for a number of decades. So, demographics. How many people are born in each year? Then we calculate the immigrants' births using that bell curve by age, and then we can show the composition of any generation and when they're going to do everything from spend money on childcare to buy a house, start a home, trade up home, spend the most money, retire, and on and on. And we get all this information. The US government is one of the best in the world at collecting information on consumers, especially, I'll show later, when they spend money on everything from cradle to grave. Canada doesn't do this. Europe doesn't do it. Australia doesn't do it. China doesn't do it. The US surveys households every year, 600 categories. Is that enough for most people? That's how I get, I mean, potato chips. I can go that far down. So, what other predictable spending have, patterns? Well, this is the macro trend. What we do at Dent Research is we take data in 10 to 15 years at a time of the government surveys of thousands of households every year so we get enough data to get this accurate. We can plot down to the year when people spend the most money and the, they, again, enter the workforce about age 20 and they spend the most at that little peak in the middle, age 46. Now, everybody doesn't do that, but on average, they do. And they continue to spend, especially if their kids are in college, and they get a nice car, and then spending drops off dramatically. So as a new generation comes up this spending curve, the economy is going to boom, and when they go down the other side, it's going to slow down. It's that simple. You don't have to guess at it. This is an easier way to, to see it. You know, you got the singles, and then you got the young marrieds, and then you got the young families on the rising side, and then you kind of got your midlife peak, and then you got your empty nesters, and then you retire, and then people die. And people dying is not too good for the economy, you can imagine. I'll show later. It's, incre it's incredibly bad for housing and real estate. Dyers are sellers, permanent sellers of real estate. And you got countries like Japan today where old people are dying faster than young people are coming up buying homes, and, and you got 8 million empty houses growing every day. So wouldn't you want to know that if you're a real estate developer or an investing in real estate? So the front end of the baby boom generation began retiring in 2000. Our workforce has been growing much less fast since then. That's a predictable thing. And there's a lot of them, so they have a bigger impact than past generations. They will continue to retire till about age 2025. Our workforce has already gone from 67% of people employed down to 62%, and by the time they peak, it's going to be 58%. We are losing workers at the speed of light, and people want wonder why the economy is having a hard time growing at 1% to 2%, even with massive stimulus. So here's the baby boomers, Bob Hope. In the blue, we show, again, 1937 to 61, not just a rising tide, but the largest rising tide in modern history. So no wonder we've had such a big boom. And note in the pink here, to follow them, Generation X. A declining tide of births, which means they will do everything in less numbers. Spend everything, invest, you name it. So. Adult life cycle, again, just to go in a little more detail. Education, 18 to 22 for most people peak. Workforce entry at 20, critical and correlates directly with inflation more than any other indicator. Apartment rentals, as they're getting married, age 26 for the baby boomers, it looks like about 29 for the millennial generation. They're definitely getting married later in a more uncertain world. Marriage, 26, same cycle for the baby boomers and 29 for the millennials. Kids, 28 for the baby boomers. It's looking like about 31 for the millennials so far. At first home, as soon as you can afford it, 31, 34 for the millennials. 
And then that largest home, 41 for the baby boomers, I'm guessing 44. We'll find out as we go along. People would think people buy their largest home when they earn and spend the most money. It's not. It's when your kids turn what age? Guess. 13. Gnarly little teenagers. <laughs> That's when everybody in the household wants more space. Kids and parents. Children leave the nest between 46 and 49. That's when the parents can start to travel and buy a car they like instead of a boring minivan to cart the kids around. They pay down their debts from 46 to 49 Fords. And again, every time I'm using the higher number, that's for the millennials. Save for retirement, almost all the savings done between 46 and retirement, 63 to 65. Vacation properties, first round of buying in the late 40s. Again, because you have time on your hands and extra income with the kids gone, and you want to lure the kids back to see you. And then a retirement home, 65 and probably be more like 68 or older for the millennials. So back to this cycle I showed earlier. This is important because we've already seen in this kind of baby boom boom some critical areas. In 2000, when the baby boomers were coming into their peak in home buying between 37 and 41, or 39 on average, the economy kind of stalled in 2000, and, and incomes have been much slower ever since because that, that's the biggest part of the ride. Total spending and, and spending on furnishings for that house peaked at 46, and that was in 2007. I predicted the baby boom generation would peak in 2007 all the way back in the late 80s when I predicted Japan would fall, just on this simple 46 number. And then spending on late stage stuff, travel, nicer automobiles, college for the people who go there, 54, and then you get the real downturn. So 2015, our economy started to stall. And of course, every time it stalls, these days, economists come up with more free money, more quantitative easing, and that just doesn't work for together. Not gonna work when we go down this steep slope and more and more baby boomers retire at 64 plus into 2025. Okay, so back to the microeconomics for a moment. Remember that potato chip example I gave you earlier. This is what you see. This is what I see in my research. Out of those 600 categories, detailed information we buy every year and accumulate every decade, we see a rising cycle of consumption by purchasing a potato chips by families into age 42 and a rapid decline as the calorie cycle declines. That simple. Here's a, that big, bigger cycle. Apartments at 26, starter homes at 31, trade-up homes 41. Furnishings and furniture, 46. College tuition for people whose kids go to college, and that's a big expense, 51. Automobiles, the nicest automobiles at age 54 for the parents, not for the kids. Hospitals at 60, the stuff people pay for before they get on Medicare and stuff. Vacation homes, 65. Cruise ships, I love this one. People travel more when their kids leave the nest in their late 40s. But they start to realize travel is stressful. Jet lag, Montezuma's revenge, customs, get waylaid in customs. I, I got waylaid all overnight in London once. So people say, you know what? Just put me on a cruise ship, stuff me with food and booze, and I'm happy. No change in <laughs> hotel rooms, no customs, nothing. And so people will travel on cruise ships 10 years later than they will on normal overseas travel, going to Europe or whatever. Prescription drugs peak at age 77, and the ultimate demographic, and I give you advice right now, you wanna invest in something and make money, guaranteed, you just invest in and buy nursing homes or nursing home companies. Because just like colleges way back in the 67, they're never gonna build enough nursing homes and they're already hard to get in. Baby boomers enter the beginning of their nursing home cycle in 2017 and then will grow for 26, 28 years. So that's the last thing people do. Who's in those nursing homes? 10 women to every one man. So the men that actually live that long, you're gonna do pretty good, okay? <laughs> I love this one. I always tell people, I know when average male has a midlife crisis, I just pull up the motorcycle graph. Almost, and this, this one I like because it's so extreme, almost all the motorcycles are bought in that midlife crisis when the kids leave and you got time and, you don't, and the kids aren't there to make fun of you on your motorcycle, 45 to 49. 
So how does that play out in the real world? Well, look at Harley Davidson stock. They grew with this. I'm just lagging this for this 45 year peak. They grew with it and they crashed with it. Even when we got this little wave of, of uh, Generation X, they grew with that and guess what? They're gonna crash again. This is how predictable our economy is down to the micro level. And when the next generation comes along, They'll never sell as many motorcycles as they did to baby boomers. They'll never need to build a bigger motorcycle plant ever again. And who knows, maybe these millennials will say they don't like motorcycles. Maybe they like something else. So again, Harley-Davidson, unit sold, followed the demographics, predictable. Here's a quote. Harley-Davidson is struggling against a foe that not even cost cutting their brand loyalty can overcome demographics. Its current owners are getting old and not enough younger ones are coming up behind them. This is a problem throughout the world. First time that most countries, not all, but most wealthy countries like the US and Japan and Europe will see a smaller generation following a larger one. Never seen that happen in modern history. And again, that's why Japan's got empty homes and, and uh, Japan hasn't been able to grow their way out of their slump. And again, Harley Davidson share price follows these same trends. So this is good for business planning and for, obviously, investing. Now again, just a couple of examples. Toys, I mean, this should be obvious. And kids up peak when the kid's in kindergarten. That's when we buy kids the most toys and, and get them their first bicycle and all that good stuff. Fast food for lunch, and of course the kids like that too. It is very similar to the potato chip cycle. And then it falls off, but it peaks in the early 40s. So would grocery stores with that calorie cycle. Electricity, not as dramatic, peaks in the early 50s and then drops off. Personal care, peaks later. People like to look good as long as they can. And then there's the cruise ships. That's a great one. The cruise ships are going to be a booming industry for many years. And of course, the number one industry out there, health care along with nursing home. As the baby boomers age, they're gonna cause healthcare to grow faster. And remember, since the baby boom is the larger generation compared to the millennials, the 10 foot wave, that's gonna make healthcare one of the few strong growth industries in the future as baby boomers age. And again, we go back to our immigration adjusted birth index. This is our leading indicator for everything in demographics. In yellow though, I've done, added something. I've made forecasts. Remember what I said earlier? When the economy's bad, people have fewer kids and immigration drops. People don't realize immigration dropped after the highest rate in history in the early 1900s, 1907 was the actual peak, dropped down to zero in the 1930s at the worst economy in history. So I take this and say, I said, remember I said earlier, 2007, we predicted births would peak for the millennials. Well, they're gonna continue to drop into about 2023 and then since these people are having fewer kids than the baby boomers did and before, the next generation is going to be smaller. This is saying our economy is going to grow sideways to down for decades and decades and decades until there's a breakthrough in aging. And I think that will happen, but I'll be the first one to tell you because I'm studying this stuff. And it's not going to happen overnight. There will come a time, biotech and where we live to be 100, 110, 120, this will solve this demographic problem because people now enter the workforce, when we said that before, 20, they retire at 63. That means they're working for only 43 years and then they're on the dole for 22. Because if you make it, life insurance actually tell, if you make it to 63, you're not gonna live to 79.6, you're gonna live to be 85. The older you get, the older you live is a general rule for actuaries. So, if we were in the workforce from 20 to let's say 100, and then retire between 100 and 110 and 20, we would have a much more productive life. Learning is exponential, it grows. People would, um, would contribute much, much more to the economy. Otherwise, until that happens, the whole developed world, except for a few small countries like Australia, are going to see no growth or negative growth, and nobody's come to terms with that, and governments just think, well, we'll just keep printing money. Well, they're not gonna ever be able to print enough money to fight trends like this. So this is how, I mean, I can look out over the next century if you wanted to know. 
I could tell you to tell your grandkids, look out for a big downturn in depression like the one we're seeing since 2008, and we'll see the worst of ahead. They're going to see that between the late 2060s and mid-2070s. I can tell you that today, because that's how predictable these things are. And again, what we do, we take that birth index, now we go out farther, we just move it forward 46 for the baby boomers, I'm assuming 48 for the millennials, and, and, and longer down the line. And again, this is a picture of the U.S. economy over the whole next century, unless we get this aging revolution, and only when we do. And, and only on a lag when that happens. So this is a, a long way out. We do not have, we will never see a boom like 1983 to 1961. And you won't see the same stock gains you had in that unprecedented boom. And your kids will not see the growth in the economy. You might want to tell them to move to Australia, be my advice. Because Australia is one of the countries that have a millennial generation much larger due to unusually high immigration rates. So we move through predictable stages in life. We change our spending in predictable ways. And when a new generation comes along and, and maybe is preferring some different products over others, we pick that up early on and we can predict it for the people following them in that generation. So again, macro to micro, our economy is far more predictable than economists have led you to believe because economists never had sex, most of them, don't understand people, <laughs> and don't study people like marketers do and like people like I do. They study governments. And another principle, the longer term we're predicting, the fewer variables drive something, the fewer cycles, and so it's more predictable. The opposite of what economists think. Shorter term, so many cycles, shorter cycles can come together and political decisions can be made. i just give you an example. I mean, I'll always remember the Donald Trump surprise election. Polls gave it to Hillary 80-some percent, and he won by surprise. And then on top of that, all market analysts assume if he won, he's so unpredictable, got the impulse control of a grease fire, is what somebody said, that he's going to be bad for the economy. Wrong on both. The markets went straight up and saw him as good for the economy. That's hard to predict. But pre me predicting in 1989 that Japan's going to have the worst downturn in modern history and the U.S. and Europe are going to have the greatest boom in history in the 1990s, that was easy. Simple. You can understand it. You can see it as well. Now, one of the reasons we have this aging problem, and this is another very predictable thing about people, is that the richer people get, and the more they live in urban areas instead of rural, the fewer kids they have. You can't talk people out of this. It costs much more to raise kids in a city. And when you're on a farm, especially decades ago, kids were seen as extra labor. You know, after age 12, the heck with school, get out there and work on the farm. So this is happening around the world. And again, until we have an aging revolution, and I have some longer term cycles that, that suggest that is inevitable and will happen. Until that happens, the whole world is slowing. Even emerging countries are having far less kids. They used to have seven, now they maybe have three. You know, we used to have four, now we have you know, one and a half or two in most countries. It's just another predictable thing. Now, again, if you look at some of our predictions, um, well, I, my, I started my newsletter in 1989 and said, hey, we got a recession ahead of us, and we had a 21% crash and a recession in the late 90, early 91. We, you know, we said, hey, the tech bubble's peaking in early 2000, and we had a crash there. And, and I said right from the beginning, in 2007, baby boomers will reach their peak in spending. We had a big crash after that, the great financial recession. And we've been living on quantitative easing ever since. It's like economists, central bankers have been trying to fill this hole of downward spending with free money. That's not good policy from my point of view, and that is going to backfire, and probably sooner than later. And this quantitative easing has created an even bigger bubble in stocks and now past the point where natural trends would drive it. So that, that tells me we're in for the biggest crash yet. So again, first crash, next crash, and the next one's going to be the biggest. I call this also a megaphone pattern. Each bubble we've had 
takes us to higher highs and each crash takes us to lower lows. All we have to do is go a little lower than the low in early 2009 and we got an 80% drop in the stock market. I don't think most people see this coming. And if you don't, your wealth is gonna be wiped out. And on top of that, we're not gonna bounce back next time and go back to new highs. When the stock market peaked in 1929, it not only crashed 89%, but it took uh, 24 years to get back to those levels in 1993. So if you'd have retired in 1929, you would have been dead by the time the stock market got back even in your portfolio, and you would have hated your stockbroker, because he would have told you, oh, you're diversified, and stocks always come back. No, they don't. Not when a generation's peak. Same thing in 68, when the Bob Hope generation peaked. It took 25 years to get back to those levels in 1993. So that's the difference. Most of the time you can stay invested, buy and hold. This is not one of those times. And neither was 29 or 68. So we're warning people, this is a time to protect your capital. And then when things crash, you can invest for the next generation's boom, but it will never be as strong as 1983 to 2007. Never, not demographically possible. Now, India's will be, because they've got very strong demographics in most of the emerging world. And that's another thing. Demographics tells us today, crystal clear, the next global boom after this crash coming in the next so many years is going to be focused in the emerging world. And if you want to make money in stocks, you can be living here, but you better be investing and betting on India going up more than Europe or Japan or even the United States. And we get, we're better than both of those demographically. So we can look at any country around the world predicted decades in advance, and we can look at any consumer sector in that country and say, oh, motorcycles here, you know, houses here, your cars here, this is when things are gonna boom. I just saw two of the, I'm not gonna mention the names, most successful investors of all time in recent years bought large retail car dealerships. That would be the worst sector, I would say, demographically, the biggest drop coming off. Housing already collapsed, autos are next. Because it is, it's housing, furnishings and autos in the durable goods sector. In 2002, we gave a major buy signal. I look at short-term things. I just have to guess because the short-term is harder. It's called technical analysis. We've got a guy, Adam Odell, at our firm that does this, shorter-term trends, much harder jobs, very difficult to do. But for once, indicators just lined up crystal clear. And I said in early October, if you don't buy stocks here, you're crazy. Market doubled in five years. And it doubled right into that 2007 peak, which I could have predicted decades in advance. So, Japan. I tell everybody, and I just don't understand why economists aren't studying Japan every day. Japan was the first wealthy country in the world to have a big baby boom, to have a stock bubble that burst, to have a housing bubble that burst, and it burst big time. People don't realize Real estate in Japan is down 67% and has been down for 26 years and has never bounced. Now, this took me a while to forget. This is a little more complicated than my normal, here's when people buy cars or potato chips, because housing lasts forever. And so when old people die, a house is freed up and you don't have to build a new house for the young person coming along. And when more old people are dying, as I said earlier, than young people coming on buying, you can have net demand for housing declining and you can have more and more empty houses as Japan has, eight million houses empty. So Japan had their big boom, had their big bust, and they got another bust coming from 2021 forward. Japan hasn't even seen the end of their demographic decline. They're the fastest aging country in the world. And I bet nobody's going to guess who's the second fastest agent. Germany, the country supposed to hold up the entire European Union. They're going to have to hold Germany up. And all of Southern Europe's just as bad. And they're the ones bankrupt. So Japan had their big Nikkei bubble, just like our Dow and S&P and NASDAQ bubble. And then it burst. And it burst these blue lines right in line, roughly, with the changes in demographic spending. This is not hard stuff. And like I said earlier, it's not over yet. They've got another decline ahead. And you've got worse and worse jobs, non-regular workers, they call it. That's the same thing we're having. Young people in the United States 
since 2007 and even 2000 when things slowed, there's been more and more part-time and bar hop jobs and stuff and less and less real good manufacturing or high quality service jobs. The same things that Japan's had. What happens, especially when a larger generation retires, they keep all their benefits, which means there's no room for the younger generation to have them. So they don't have as good a job. They don't have as good entitlements and benefits. In Japan today, young people mostly are not interested in dating, sex, or marriage because they can't afford to. Couldn't dare afford to have a kid with their jobs and dependents. So that makes their demographics worse. So here's that crash. And again, my first book, Our Power to Predict, in 1989 said Japan will witness a 12 to 14 year major crash and downturn. People thought I was an absolute nut because Japan looked like they could do no wrong. Can you think of another country that looks like they can do no wrong or keep growing? Everybody says they're going to be bigger in the United States. China. China's workforce is already shrinking starting in 2011. Here's that 14-year decline, bottomed in 2003. Really, it's going to be a 33-year decline before this is all over down the road. And again, percentage of workers getting subpar salaries. We've seen this before, on and on. Now, remember I said early, S-curve adoption. This, this is an important principle, because throughout history, it's very simple. The, we grow at a rate that is consistent with one, how fast is our workforce growing? That's totally predictable. And what's the productivity growth? How much productive are, are workers getting? And workers that are aging into their peak incomes, into their 40s, get more productive. Workers also get more productive when new technologies come along, like the assembly line in manufacturing, or automobiles and trucks that can move things faster everywhere, or the internet and personal computing in your, the world in your and does that make people more productive until Facebook came along, ruined everything? Here's automobiles. People think it's a straight line. In 1900, they commercialized after being invented way back here. It took seven years to get 1% of urban households, and still then, little house on the prairie. 60% of people lived in rural areas and farms and stuff. It took another seven years to get to 10% in 1914. This was the Model T in 1907 that made cars cheaper, and then the assembly mine made them really cheaper fast. So cars from 1914 to 1928, two more seven-year periods, went from 10% to 90%. Just 14 years. Imagine if you were a business and you missed that. If you just said, okay, we went to da da da, one da, to ten, so we'll go from ten to twenty. Well, you'd have missed seventy percent of the market. You wouldn't have had enough factories. I was consulting to Firestone Tire uh, in the early '80s when radial tires were replacing bias tires, and this was on an S curve. And I did one simple S curve analysis chart that showed them they had to close most of their bias tire plants and build radials faster than they could imagine. The company wouldn't be around today if they hadn't done that, and they're still laggards. But, but they would have been dead because they were about to miss the biggest S-curve in their industry in a long time. Today, same thing. We predicted way back. The Internet will peak around between 2008 and 10, and that's it marched right up this S-curve. The Internet and in, in, in personal computing didn't have that much impact in the 80s and early 90s because only nerds had them, and they were still big and clunky. As soon as they got small and the Internet leveraged them, it became a mainstream phenomenon. So this increases productivity. Our productivity now is near zero in the United States. Our workforce growth is roughly zero because of demographics. But the productivity is because of aging and because we've already gotten the major impact of the Internet. Again, my research business, I would say I have tripled in my personal productivity because of email and Google. I used to have three people doing full-time research for me. Now I split a person with my partner. One half a person doing more research than ever. Because I used to ask them, find this, find that. And then I said, well, wait a minute. I, I know what I'm looking for. I'll just Google it. Boom, nine out of ten times. Instant answer. Facebook, dancing dogs and cats. That's what I call it. It's entertainment. But it's not. A, in fact, there could be a lot of companies going to have to basically be policing people for, you know, goofing off on Facebook at work half the day. 
So again, we've got our generational spending waves about every 40 years. In fact, stock market has peaked 1929, 1968, and 2007, exactly 39 years apart. So we can predict that. In every generation, these generation waves are different in different countries, as I said earlier. So we can predict it anywhere around the world. But then there's inflation. And I tell you, I mean, this was the biggest surprise to me. It was not a surprise to realize that people spent the most money in their late, you know, mid to late 40s. That made total sense. I could not figure out when I found the correlation between workforce growth and inflation why that would be until I really thought about it. You know, what I said earlier, young people cause inflation. They cost everything and produce nothing. Young people entering at rapid rates like the baby boomers into the late 70s and older people exiting. Younger people are inflationary. Older people exiting is deflationary. So I can predict when inflation is going to rise, when it's going to fall, and when it's going to turn to deflation. And the bottom of deflation is going to be about 2023 for the U.S. Economists are printing money to fight deflation. Everybody says it's going to cause inflation. We said it's not going to cause inflation. People cause inflation. Governments are doing, what do they always do? Reacting. Not creating the trends, reacting to them, fighting it by printing money to offset deflation because they don't want another Great Depression on their watch. But the important point here, in college, two big insights, the life insurance actuaries, oh my God, you can predict people way out in the future with averages. And the second one was to see four stages of growth, four seasons. Every cycle I've studied in my career has four seasons just like the weather annually. And I'm talking cycles that go out thousands of years, millions of years, down to months. And I can predict, and I created this model all the way back in 1989, because I put together the generational spending booms, 1942 to 68 for the Bob Hope generation, 44-year lag on the birth index, exactly, and happened exactly, 69 to 82, their down wave. So that's a boom and a bust. And then the baby boom, 83 to 2007, and they're down wave into 2022-23. But I can predict inflation with workforce growth. It was the baby boomers entering the workforce at the highest rates in history that caused the highest inflation rates in modern history. That killed the bond markets. That killed the stock markets. And it was called stagflation. Economists called it stagflation, but didn't have a clue what caused it. They still say today, oh, the central banks caused it. Central banks did not create that inflation. They weren't printing money back then. In fact, they were raising rates to try to fight the inflation. Baby boom comes along, even bigger generation, joined by a huge wave of immigrants, making them even bigger. And this happens in the fall bubble boom season. So you have a spring boom, Bob Hope generation, a summer recession with high inflation, you have a fall bubble boom because the technologies, when did the internet move mainstream like automobiles in the roaring 20s? In this boom. So everything clicks and you're always going to get bubbles, the strongest stock markets. And when those bubbles peak and deleverage, you get deflation and you get the winter season. Winter season is a big reset so you can go back and start another four stage cycle and enter spring. Japan's been fighting their winter season with quantitative easing, eat three times the rate we have and for twice as, more than twice as long, and they've never entered winter. That's the price they're paying. Something for nothing does not pay off. An economist is going to learn this the hard way when this quantitative easing, fake, talk about fake news, try fake boom and fake bubble when it crashes, and it will. Now I'll show you one more thing to conclude here, because I started with demographics, but I am a cycle guy by nature. And when I came up with these inflation and spending, generational spending wave indicators, I was able to predict the whole next 10, 12 years, flawlessly with nothing else, called the whole thing. But then in early 2000, what happened? Early 2000, 9-11, woo, that changed things. So I dig and dig and dig, and I finally find, oh my gosh, there is a repeatable, predictable 35-year geopolitical cycle, 17 to 18 years positive, like 1983 to 2000. Almost nothing went wrong in the world of significance. And then from 9-11 to now, what? Everything's gone wrong. This cycle points down into early 2020 before it starts to turn up again. Stocks are worth half as much 
at the bottom of the cycle than they are at the top. So this was important. I learned this the hard way. When I saw that final wave of baby boomers coming and the final S curve of the internet, I'm like, oh my God, we're gonna have another bubble just like 95 to 2000. And it was only half the bubble because the geopolitical trends caused a kind of a, a level of fear and risk where stocks didn't go up. They went up, earnings went up exactly as much as we predicted. The stock market only went up half as much. So that was a good lesson. Same thing, productivity. I found out in history, every 45 years, steamships peaked in 1875, fell off a cliff, railroads 1920, fell off a cliff, automobiles saturated in 1965, slowed down, and now the internet peaked around 2010. So productivity, not just because of the aging of the baby boomers, which is a big enough reason, productivity is not going to be as strong in the years ahead. This cycle doesn't bottom until 2032, long time from now. And then there's a decennial, about a 10-year boom-bust cycle. I got a secret formula for this, and I'm not going to tell you what it is, not because I don't want to. It would take too long to explain. The important point of this graph, if you look back, when all four of these cycles turned down together, as they did from 1930 to 34, and 1969 to 76, and 2014 to 2020, this is when you're almost guaranteed to have a major financial crisis. So these governments have been pushing off with quantitative easing. I'm saying the danger period is between 2017 and early 2020. That's sometime in that time we're probably going to see a big crash. Remember I said earlier, it's probably going to be something like 80%. And every major stock bubble burst in history has been about 80% and some 90. That's what you expect when a bubble bursts instead of a normal healthy boom. Second thing I warn investors, why you be more cautious, is that half of that crash, and this happened in 1929 Dow crash, happened in 1990 Nikkei, Japan crash, happened in the 2000 tech wreck, and it happened in the 2015 second China bubble burst, half of that crash, 40, 45%, will happen in the first two and a half to three months. So investors that wait to see if I'm right, get creamed right off the bat. So again, to summarize, demographics are destiny. And there are other important cycles, but demographics is still the most fundamental and people drive trends, not our government. Look at where the ball is going. Look at people, their productivity, their earning and spending, not government policies, which are hard to predict and don't have as big an impact as their egos think they do. Because people tell, I even listen to people say, oh, the conspiracies, the Rockefellers control everything. I said, if they controlled everything like these people said, I couldn't predict the economy. I can predict the economy because I follow people, the real trends. And it says, after the greatest boom in history from 1983 to 2007, and now after endless quantitative easing that's only made the stock market way more overvalued, cause high speculation, even more debt around the world, we're gonna to have to wash out this debt, wash out these bubbles, and it's gonna be very, very painful. But if you see it coming, as a business, as a household or investor, you're gonna see the sale of a lifetime, I call it, my most recent book. The opportunities come, Joseph Kennedy made a fortune in a matter of years simply by getting out of the stock market in 1929 and reinvesting when it was down 89%. He's buying everything for 11 cents on the dollar. How do you make money faster than that? You didn't even have to short the market. Just be safe and reinvest as one sector after the next turns around. And the emerging world and commodities will turn around before most developed countries, and real estate will be the last to turn around. So there's going to be huge opportunities in the years ahead, but you have to realize this is a once-in-a-lifetime winter season, depression, deflationary period. Deflation means, in my language, everything goes down, except for the highest quality currencies like the U.S. dollar and the highest quality bonds. Everything else goes down. So your stockbroker will tell you, don't worry, I got you diversified. It's not going to do you any good. You have to have systems like we have that can make money systematically in up or down markets because buy and hold is going to be dead until about 2023, and at least 2020. So that's my message. Um, please look at our new book, The Sale of a Lifetime, because, of course, you're going to need to have conviction to make some of the types of decisions in your business, in your investments, in your life. I even moved because of this information. 
to a place I feel a little safer than I was before because I think this is going to be a difficult time. So again, I wish you the best of luck in your investing, your business. And again, if you see this coming, it will be the most opportune in your life, not the biggest threat. Thanks for being a good audience.